have with me as a guest today, Connor Swenson. And Connor is the CEO of Forgewell, uh, co-found with Claire Deenan. Uh, they work with leader teams and leaders to sustain high performance. Uh, and he is also host of a brand new course that we have with 42 Courses, Sustainable Productivity. So just before we start properly, I will just ask you all uh, if possible to mute yourselves so that we don't get any chat in the background whilst I'm talking to Connor. Thanks very much. And so despite huge advances in technology, AI, robotics, we're busier and more burnt out than ever. And in some studies we read, they say that more than two thirds of employees globally are not engaged with their work. What on earth is happening? Uh, we're delighted, as I said, to have Connor with us here today. And Connor, for the people who've joined us today uh, who don't already know you, maybe you can give them a little introduction about yourself, your background and how you came about uh, creating Forge Well. Sure. And welcome everyone. And thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm originally from the, the U S born and raised in, in Minnesota, currently zooming in from Lisbon, Portugal, our new home. But I think my story with this course, uh, and these topics began when I, I joined Google in New York city, uh, pretty soon after graduating university. And, I came in to Google through a, a back door, uh, I like to say, a very non-traditional hiring route. Uh, I kind of eked my way in and I felt a lot of imposter syndrome when I got there. I looked around and people had these very fancy sounding degrees and were very uh, brilliant uh, and bright people. And I thought, wow. How am I gonna how am I gonna succeed in a place like this? And so I started looking for answers. And this is when I first fell into the world of productivity and time management. I was trying to figure out how could I get better at work? How could I not just keep up with the pace of Google, but perform at my very best? And a lot of the things I learned in those early years were helpful. I got more efficient at managing my emails and my inbox, more organized, more structured. However, I started to realize that the more I kind of focused on just productivity, uh, the more I started to just feel exhausted and, and tired. And, and maybe people on the call can relate. It's like you show up to work, you open up, you know, maybe your emails open up first thing when you wake up, but you get to the office and it's just back-to-back -back meetings, endless calls, the inbox is always overflowing. And the race to get through everything is, is, is never won. And I started, uh, I started looking for new, new approaches. Um, and I, I moved with, with Google to San Francisco where I met Jake and John who wrote the book, Make Time, which we reference in, in the course. Those were some of the early inklings of, of changing my approach to productivity and time management, putting efficiency to one side, but focusing more on how I could be most effective. Um, and then a lot of it kind of snowballed into when I moved to London in, in 2016 with Google. I joined a team culture that was a bit uh, toxic, and um, I did what I knew best. I turned to productivity to deal with the stress of a team that wasn't really performing. And I burnt myself out. I started to become really cynical. I wasn't engaged at all. I just felt kind of helpless. And I, I, I would complain forever and always to anyone who would listen about my predicament. And um, I realized something had to, to change. My life was by suffering, my relationships were suffering. So I started to dive a little bit deeper and to untangle um, some of the, the inner issues that I was facing. And I started practicing meditation and mindfulness. I started really moving my body a lot more, exercising more, taking care of my mental health. And I started to see that I used to look at that type of stuff as not productive because it wasn't helping me check off to do's. But I started to, to realize, wow, the more I take care of myself, manage my own mental and emotional health, the more present and engaged I feel at work, the more effective I become. And 
And I was really happy to find, find a new approach. And I started seeing success. Um, it led to some amazing promotions. And uh, eventually, I wanted to, to share what I was learning with the world. So I left Google. I, st- I started ForgeWell just around the time of the pandemic. I quit two weeks before we heard of uh, COVID-19. <laughs> And the last three years have been amazing. So we, uh, me, my wife, a team of talented facilitators, we work with companies like like Google, my ex, my ex employer, L'Oreal, Squarespace, Klarna. And we help these teams kind of find that balance between well being and performance, and, and help them beat burnout. So it's always hard to wrap up a ten year sort of story in three minutes. But I am looking at the clock. I think that's probably enough of the bio <laughs> to get people interested. So I'll stop there. I'm sure there's plenty of people on the call, Connor, who really understand what you're talking about. And I heard you say there that you were balancing efficiency versus being effective. Yeah. What 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 how do you categorize the difference between those those two words? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a tough one. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with being efficient. I think efficiency is about sort of saving time, getting things done as fast as possible, but it kind of applies to anything. So you look at your to-do list, you have 50 tasks. How efficiently can you clock through all those tasks? But it doesn't really ask the question of like, which of these tasks is most important? Like which of these truly matter? And I think effectiveness is more about uh, focusing on the right things. And often in the world that we live in, it comes at, we have to sacrifice some of the efficiency because when we get stuck on this sort of hamster wheel of trying to churn through every email in our inbox, it leaves us drained and there's no time left over to focus on the big important stuff. So I advocate for a different approach, which is Start by asking yourself what's important to you, your team, your family, your community. Build that into your calendar, build that into your your routines and worry less about finishing everything on your to-do list, emptying your inbox. It's it's a game that really can't be won. Um, and I think we have we have a I talk about this in the course, but we go back to Frederick Taylor who's very famous in the world of time management. He came up with a theory called Taylorism, and he was around at the time of the Industrial Revolution. He literally, Luis, was in factories with a stopwatch, clocking people, seeing, okay, if I give them a slightly larger shovel, is that going to increase the efficiency of the person digging out you know, coal in the pit or working in the factory? So he was literally doing this, and he, he birthed this new industry which which was amazing. It gave us, you know, really effect, really, really productive factories. But when you think about it, we, we've applied some of these, these ideas that are 100 years old to our modern day work, which is so different. Um, we're much, it's much more important to be creative, to think laterally, to be strategic, to, uh, to collaborate. And a lot of these things aren't done when you're thinking about how can I most efficiently do this What's the quickest way to save off, uh, save a few extra minutes? And, and so I try to kind of dispel some of these old ideas about efficiency and productivity. And I, I think, you know, I, I still use some of these tools. I still think there's great ways to be a bit more efficient to do things. Nothing wrong with that. But I think uh, if you're only focused on that and you forget to ask yourself, well, what's really important? If I spend all day doing 100 tasks that don't really matter. And I totally ignore the one that does. Have I been that effective? Uh, probably not. Good, 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 good answer. And uh, I'm sure the things there that, uh, as I say, lots of people are relating to uh, comments that you're making, because of course, we all go off into the workforce, we start jobs, we've been interviewed, but very few of us receive any kind of training in terms of the uh, how to actually how to do your job you know the the, the just the, as yeah. you say the managing managing your emails choosing where to go choosing which task to do first yeah uh this is one of the you've hit it on the nose it's it's one of the major challenges today is like most jobs that we're doing haven't really been done before there's not often a playbook for, for many jobs in the sort of knowledge economy where we work with our, our minds. 
Um, and it's very difficult, even for people when I ask them to, to write down the lists of, of, we do an activity in our, our make time workshops called Stack Rank Your Life. And we, we say, okay, put on your list, like what are the big projects and areas of responsibility? Not your to-do list, but like, what are the sort of spheres of, of work that you've got? And even that's difficult for people to conceptualize because a lot of people, you know, the research shows that in a normal day, a person works across nine different spheres. So nine different projects or areas in a given day. So you might wake up and you manage a team. And so you might think one of my spheres is, is just dealing with questions that are coming from my team. Okay. And then you might sit on a, on a leadership committee for diversity inclusion that meets every month. So you, then you have some tasks over here to do this. Okay. But then the, the, the main part of your job is maybe, uh, you know, running, a, running this global marketing team. So you have to think about what's the, what's the overall goal for the year? What are our key campaigns and creative projects? So you start to see it gets very complex for people even to think about like, what are the projects that I have and what are the areas of responsibility? And um, I think that's why it's very easy to just be very reactive at work. And it's very easy to just wake up and look at your emails as a sign of what you need to get done today. But oftentimes the answer of what really needs to get done, it's not always staring at you in your inbox. It's the, that sort of project, that thing that is, is, is in your mind, but it's kind of getting pushed off someday, maybe when I have time. So yeah, I think conceptualizing knowledge work, also just figuring out how teams work together. Um, you know, the medium in which we work is, is very important. Um, so when a team works only in Slack, it's a very different style of work than if a team works only in email or only in face-to-face -face meetings. And most teams never have a conversation about how are we going to effectively collaborate with all of these tools, you know, which, which tool works for what, you know, how do we know a decision has been made and is that shared? Because I, I get this all the time from people at, at large companies I work with. It's like, they're like, I'm trying to get some work done. And then I get four different messages in Microsoft Teams. And if I don't reply to them in five minutes, I get 10 more. And if I don't get that, they email me. And if I don't reply to the email in 20 minutes, they call me. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like that is just so overwhelming for so many people um, because it's never been addressed of like, what are our, our expectations with all of this? And it's it's a big challenge that we we don't have all the answers to, but we're we're trying to unpick it for teams that we work with. The great uh, subjects that you've brought up, um, as you say, even just addressing things like whatever is your productivity tool that you're using, just basically having an agreement as to what's the time period within which we expect people to respond. And it's just basic little things like that. But as you say, there's so many different productivity tools, it's hard to set a rule for, for yeah. just one of them. Yeah. And it's changing so fast. It's, you know, it people, their big problem was email. And for many people it is today, but now I work with a lot of teams that they don't even touch email. Mm -hmm. So now Slack, Slack is the challenge. Um, and Slack has been around for you know, 2016, I guess, six years. And in five years, there's going to be a whole new suite of tools. And so it's, we're constantly having to sort of adapt. And um, I think this is, this is tough. You know, one of the benefits perhaps of working in a, a factory, you know, was you had people whose job was to help you become more efficient. And, you know, maybe didn't like that because they were watching you with a, a stopwatch and saying, Luis, I, you know, you, you, were, you made 20 widgets yesterday, but 12 today, what's happening? Like, let's go. But you had people that were spending time thinking, how do we, how does this, how do you become more efficient? Whereas now in Cal Newport, who I, I love a lot, he talks about this too. It's like somehow this has now become each individual's responsibility. So each of us now has a personal responsibility, it seems, to manage our, our own productivity and, and, and to figure out what tools we're going to use and what are our processes and and we have to keep on top of it because there's new tools and new ways and people are joining and in big companies, there's reorganizations, you have new teammates and new collaborators. So I think the smartest organizations are 
trying to offload that from employees a little bit and say, yeah, we can teach you a few personal tools, techniques that you can use, but we as a company or as an organization, we're going to have some guidelines and we're going to help you guys, you know, we're going to think about how we all communicate because it's kind of everyone left to their own devices these mm -hmm. days. Um, and that's a big challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, we don't want this to just become a sort of chum fest where we all agree about all of the problems that we do have. And we're all <laughs> keen to uh, chat as well about solutions. Uh, all of you who've joined us today, I say you're very welcome. And do please put your questions into the chat for Connor. So starting to sort of turn it and be a little bit more solutions focused. Um, Chris and I were chatting actually before this about the whole subject of procrastination uh, and I can see there Nina in the chat there's also talking about procrastination so what would you say would be sort of your first approach in terms of advising somebody who says you know I just really seem to procrastinate on things and never get down to or like you hide your worst job at the bottom of your list and that type of thing it's a tough, a tough one to to crack procrastination. Um, you know, it's a an avoidance strategy that I think we all use, um, and it depends like on the task. So it's like maybe we're procrastinating on something because we don't actually know where or how to start. So sometimes that's sometimes it's very practical for people. It's just like they have a big challenge and they it's too vague so my advice would be okay think to yourself or if you can't talk with one of your colleagues and just figure out like what's the smallest like most obvious next step that i can do um and build yourself kind of uh you know an on ramp uh into that project or work because sometimes it's it's really just it feels too vague that and we're like it's like we we give ourselves finish presentation, but we're like, shit, I haven't started the presentation. So like, okay, what's the first step? And, and think about that. So that can be good. Um, the second thing it can be, uh, you know, there's just a, maybe a fear of, of failure. I think a lot of procrastination is more, more of an emotional decision. Um, so if it's a, if it's something that's just that there's some fear that like, oh, maybe if I do this, I won't be good enough, or maybe this, presentation is not going to be as as smart as the one that I saw my coworker gave last week. In that case, I would tell you, reach out to somebody, find some support, and just share with them, like, look, I'm trying to trying to figure this thing out. Could you help me? Could we talk through some ideas on this? When we're isolated and alone, which way too many people are, we forget that our most valuable resource is often another human being. So when there's sort of a fear behind it, then I think you should talk to somebody. Um, sometimes if you're procrastinating it on, on, for a long time, you might just ask yourself, is this, is this actually important to me? Um, cause sometimes we just don't, we, we look at a task and we're like, it's just, I don't want to do it. It's actually, I mean, over time you might just feel like, oh, I've procrastinated long enough that it's no longer an issue. And in which case I think procrastination can be a good strategy. Um, so I think to Chris's point too, is it needed? Yeah, for creative work, um, I, I'm not sure I would say that you need to necessarily procrastinate, but I would say that a lot of creativity is not going to come at your computer, you know, in the work day. A lot of it is going to be is going to come while you're out on an afternoon walk, while you're in the canteen having a coffee with your coworker, while you're in the bath or the shower or on the treadmill in the morning. Uh, so we really do need to make space and make time for that in our lives because creativity is is often happening when we are we've been thinking about a task and it's been absorbing our attention but then we're doing something else and the mind is almost magically picking that thing apart and then you have aha moments and that's the that's a problem in today's world is people are so back to back so busy. And then anytime that we have free time, we're tethered to our devices that we're not giving our, our mind the time it needs to just wander and just kind of be in open space. And so 
you know, a lot of famous creatives going back generations had practices for this of, you know, long afternoon walks or taking weeks off and going on ski trips and in the Alps is a, is a, a, you know, these types of things that you think, oh, this isn't productive, but it can be very creative. Um, my, my last tip, my favorite way to beat procrastination, I do it a lot, is um, I join these virtual co-working sessions. Um, I use Focusmates or Flown, two of my, my favorite companies. I know affiliation, but um, yeah, you, these are, they both work. You sign up, you get matched with other people, and you do a live session. You say, Luis, my goal is I'm going to finish a you know, the brief for this agency and I'm going to send it out and I got 50 minutes and then Luis goes, I'm finishing my taxes and I go, good luck. And we put ourselves on mute. You're in a zoom room and you work. And at the end you go and tell them, and did you do it? Did you not? And it's so effective for me personally. Um, so I love using that technique. It, it's a lot of stuff going on there, social pressure, the accountability of speaking, what you're going to do, having a time restricted window so I love virtual co-working um, and I, it's blown up in the last few years. So I recommend trying it if you haven't. That's really interesting, Connor. It's not something I've heard of. So I'm just going to yeah. repeat those two. You said focus mates and yeah, flown. flown. Flown and maybe it's just focus mates. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, that feeds also quite well into another question I wanted to ask you about sort of when, when you're talking about taking breaks is sort of proactively using some type of time blocking tool or scheduling your own diary to remind you to take breaks things like that what do you think about about that about time block do you use anything like that yourself or is there oh, a particular method yeah, that no, worked for you absolutely can i share my screen uh, absolutely i'd love that <laughs> all right here's my my desktop you can see can you see this? You can, can you see this little? Yes, yeah, yeah, can, great, can you see thanks. this little this little yeah. timer up here? Okay, yeah. So this this is a tool that I use. It's called Timeout. Um, uh, okay. you know, I, I gave I gave him like five pounds a couple of years ago. So you know, I've 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 a, you can do it for free, but um, you can see the window that I'm sharing. Yeah, that says can. yeah. So yeah. I use this all day. I love it. There's tons that you can download on Mac, and I'm sure you can do it on Windows too. So. I set these little micro breaks every 30 minutes, take a five minute break. So that's kind of Pomodoro style. Yeah. You know, when the break comes, it kind of pops up on my screen. I just stretch, I oh, move my body. Lovely. Yeah, it's super nice. This, you can change what it does. Right now it's got these mm. fall leaves. Um, you know, you can postpone the break if you're really in the midst. Yeah. And then I have like a normal break going, um, which is about every 90 minutes. Um, that I take a 20 minute break. So I love this, this tool. It gives me just nice little reminders. Um, you know, I, I'm, it depends. I'm flexible. I don't, I don't always, you know, some days like today, I'm kind of in some back to back. So I have some shorter meetings. I don't always have time, but uh, I'd say 80% of my days I'm using those just to give me a little nudge. And uh, I find when I do take those breaks proactively, uh, I feel so much more energized by the end of the day. Um, so it's really funny that like a five minutes here, I just, you know, get up, stretch, stand out on the balcony if I can, or, you know, take a, a, a longer break. I go step outside or I just, you know, go clean up in the kitchen, do something with my hands. At the end of the day, I feel so much better. So I really encourage that. Um, you know, there isn't any scientific research backing the Pomodoro method, which is 25 minutes of focus, five minute break, 25, five, usually about three rounds, and then you take a longer break. But there is a lot of evidence that we and our attention and our energy fluctuate quite naturally every 90 minutes or so through what's called ultradian rhythms. Probably if you're on the call, you've heard of a circadian rhythm, which is a 24 hour cycle. We have a lot of circadian rhythms, our body temperature uh, changes on a 24 hour cycle, our sleep and wake wakefulness, they exist on a circadian rhythm. You probably heard of that. So generally every 24 hours, uh, there's a window that our body wants to sleep. Now we have the same thing within a 24 hour cycle called ultradian rhythms. The body has 
also cycles that exist longer than uh, a day. So a, a menstrual cycle, for instance, is a longer uh, than a day, you know, 28 day cycle or so. Um, so that, that's right. But with an ultradian rhythm, every day you're kind of going through these natural like peaks and then valleys of energy. So I try to time my breaks roughly in those in those increments. And I, I just pay attention. And that's where mindfulness is so powerful. Mindfulness being like awareness of just what's happening. How do I feel? Like, where's my attention? And now after doing this for you know many, many years, I can just sense, I start to just feel a little bit more like I want a distraction. I, my focus starts waning around that 90 minutes mark. Then I know, okay, time to take a, a break. Um, 20 minutes is the optimal break time. Um, if you can, if you can manage that, that's a great amount of time to, to allow the body to decompress. Mm -hmm. A lot of amazing biochemical stuff would happen when you're really relaxing in that break. You flush the body of stress hormones and cortisol, which build up when you're focused. Uh, it's enough time to kind of allow you to mentally reset as well and think about what do I want to do next. So I, I use break timers and I'm a big nerd with all this type of stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and that tool that you use there, Chris, that you showed us, that was called Time, um, uh, uh, time Out. Sorry, it was called Time Out. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, it's, okay, uh... that's great. And I, I find that really interesting what you're saying about uh, maybe, you know, taking a step back and recognizing our own bodily rhythms, because the opposite of that is we can start to get cross with ourselves and you think, oh, I just can't focus or what's wrong with me? You know, you've been <laughs> chundering away for however long, I don't know, nearly two hours. And you're like, why can't I just, why can't I concentrate anymore? But just actually acknowledging that you have this cycle is would be more so much more productive at that stage yeah just acknowledging for a fact that you're human, human. <laughs> yeah that you're you're an animal that has that has animal needs yeah. uh we're not robots yeah we have a very you know our energy especially the cognitive yeah. resource that we can deploy every day it's limited um yeah. And that's why I think it's um, for people to, you know, I, I find the study of attention and consciousness and awareness and so interesting to pay attention because it's not that it's not that being focused is like the best state of attention. No, and like if you're if you're focused, you have the blinders on. You're like you're really in this. You know, like eyes are on the task. You're lasered in, but like as important as focus is this more open awareness. Like when we can be sitting in a park and we can be taking in the sky and the clouds and hearing the birds chirping and watching people and the kids playing, and we can really experience the senses of, of being alive. And in those moments, we feel, we feel happy and joyful and maybe ideas come up to us or we, we get clarity. And like, that's also a state of, of attention. And it's like, we need to be, I think, that's the problem with productivity is I think it fetishizes sometimes this idea of just like focus and like mm. getting it done. Mm. But um, we have to kind of oscillate and we do naturally oscillate and we can't, you cannot, there's no one that can focus for eight hours in a row. It's, biologically, it's not happening. So like we have to appreciate that we can, we can kind of get our focus in mm. and we can really protect that, right? We can, we can take steps to minimize interruptions and close out those things that maybe we don't want to spend time on, but get in the way. And, and we really, really use those couple hours a day, but then to recognize, okay, when am I stepping back? And, and then that's when you fill up the cup, when you actually pull back from that state, you relax, you're open. We're as humans were designed, you know, all of these states of attention, they exist for reasons. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have evolved it otherwise. So I, I don't, I also want to say that mind wandering and daydreaming are vital, super important parts of, of being. And, um, we just got to be careful sometimes that when, when we need to do something and we want to get our focus, if we're kind of daydreaming and we're scrolling TikTok or Instagram, like uh, again and again, and then we're building up stress because we haven't done this thing. That's, that's what, that's what the conversation I have with teams is, is like, how do we, how do we use the focus we have? put it where it matters, 
feel good about our work, um, but take care of ourselves because it's two sides of the same coin. And um, obviously, we've made great strides in the workplace in recent years with just acknowledgement of the importance of recognizing wellness, diversity. I mean, we've just made so many great strides, but the fact remains there's still plenty of dinosaurs out there who still think we should be chundering away for eight hours a day. Um, I don't know, do you have any uh, tips in terms of, you know, if I was, say, part of a team where the only attitude is just what well, we're permanently firefighting, get on with it. You know, how do I sort of bring it up within a meeting, you know, that I'd like to, you know, introduce maybe a, a better way of working? I mean, I, it's, it's a tough one. I would, uh, if it's really bad and it's driving you crazy and it's you're burnt out and and it doesn't seem to change then i would i'd also say are there other options mm -hmm. like is this the place that you have to to work but i'm not going to encourage anyone on this job to go and, and quit their employer <laughs> don't quit your jobs out there <laughs> um but you might start a conversation um and maybe share is an article maybe a podcast that you found interesting and say, Hey, you know, I, I heard, uh, I heard this little bit about, you know, multitasking. I listened to a great episode. I just did myself on, on armchair expert, Doc Shepard's podcast with Gloria Marks, who is someone I cite in the sustainable productivity course. She's an expert on multitasking attention at UC Irvine. It's a really fun interview. And she talks about the perils of multitasking and how it's bad for our performance and it's bad for our health and our well-being. Yeah, we all do it. Um, and I might share a podcast like that with my team and say, I found this super interesting. Um, like, what do you guys think? Does this spark any ideas like as a light way? Um, so I think starting a conversation, I think Another thing you can do is, is, you know, you could speak to your, your manager, you could speak to the team and say, guys, like we're firefighting all the time, but I really want to build in some periods of the day where I can stay focused because this is really disruptive for me. And there's evidence, you know, you can cite a few stats and figures, find some of your own, say the evidence that being interrupted all the time isn't good for our, our focus. How about um, I'm going to try to do this on Monday, Wednesday for one hour each day. Um, can you try to help me protect this time? And I would say start really small, like propose something you want to try out, frame it as an experiment, you know, not I'm doing this forever, but hey, for the next few weeks, for a month, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can try it together. Maybe we can do this. Um, and I think yeah, starting a conversation, proposing a small experiment that you're going to do or doing with your team, and then also leading by example. Um, so I think a lot of us, we feel we we just have to respond. We should respond to everything as fast as possible. We have a lot of expectations, but a lot of, when I unpick this with leaders and, and the people we coach, it's a lot of it's in, it's a self expectation, and we kind of are we're we're we've built up this idea of what it looks like to be effective and productive, and we're living out this story, and we don't ever take a second to question: Is anyone really making me do this, or am I doing this? So I encourage people to sometimes ask: hmm, Maybe there maybe there is a bit more latitude for me to pull back from that reactionary cycle, um, and if you do that. And you start to practice the things we talk about in the course, your well-being is going to go up, your performance and productivity are going to go up. And everyone who I've who's, who's who's worked with me and in my own experience that's done these things consistently, that the reaction is never, what the hell? Like, how come you seem so happy and like you're getting a lot of stuff done, Louise? Like, what the like this is annoying. Most of the time, people start going, wow. What are you doing? How, how how come you're doing that? So interesting. So you take breaks during the day. What do you use? That's interesting. Leading by example is, is the most powerful way to, to shape that culture anyways, and to do these things um, and to let the results speak for themselves because people will get curious. Um, and if an organization or a team is 
is adamant that you should never take a break. You should never leave your computer. You have to be checking your email in Slack 24 seven, then I think it's a dinosaur. I think you should consider other <laughs> options. <laughs> That's really great advice, Kana. Um, Chris as well has just referred there to changes in AI. And I, I mentioned as we opened that, you know, we make huge strides and advances. We still seem to work just as hard. I mean, there's hundreds, I say, I think I read there that had already been 2000 plus you know, if these AI, or maybe it's 2 million flipping neck, I don't know. It's a lot of things have been registered since the, you know, advance of chat GPT of AI tools to help us uh, in productivity. And I say, oh, isn't that great? You know, something that would have taken me eight hours to put together. I can have a draft there now just in five minutes. It's yeah. not necessarily better though, is it? What, what, how, what, what are your feelings about... Uh, these rapid advance, very yeah. fast advances we seem to be making at the moment. I mean, when I started doing this type of of work um, with myself and then within teams at Google, I was quite convinced, um, and this is now like six, seven years ago, that what's going to separate people in the workforce are the human skills. Mm -hmm. You know, the emotional intelligence, the ability to collaborate, the ability to think, um, you know, outside the box for lack of a better phrase. But um, because back then we already started to see like lots of mundane stuff is getting automated. So lots of the busy work uh, and, you know, studies say that the majority of our time for, as knowledge workers is spent on the busy work, scheduling meetings, rescheduling meetings, talking about the project, but not actually doing the work in the project. You know, I was convinced back then that, that that's going to separate us. And now I'm way more convinced that if you're going to succeed in the new world, it's going to be the, the ability to use your greatest gift, which is your attention and, and to put that onto problems that actually matter. So I do think AI is going to do a wonderful service in terms of our efficiency. Um, and it's already done a lot for me. I'm using ChatGPT every day now and testing it and, and trialing it in new ways in our business. I, I, I love what I see. Um, I, I had to make, you know, I was, I'm taking, like, dealing with a, 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 this, this, this health issue. And so I've been taking some more supplements and I had it graph out and make a table of all of the things and put put it into my, my, my daily supplement routine. And it was, it's amazing. Like it would have taken me like four hours. It did in three minutes. Mm. I think the challenge is we're going to, we're going to be required to do harder and harder stuff at work because all of the easy stuff is going to have been offloaded. And so being able to muster that, that skill of, of focus and creativity is going to become even more paramount but I think the risk is that we do need a balance in the day. Like we can't be a hundred percent on, as I mentioned all the time and, and replying to emails and having those little chats about, you know, the small little work things. And then, and this read, looking at the diaries, those things, when they're low cognitive effort, you know, we, we replenish a little bit during those types of tasks. So I think that's one of the challenges too, is like, what will the world look like? Are they going to expect that you do three to four hours of work where you're really engaged and you're doing really important thinking and collaborating? Um, and then that's it uh, because the rest of the stuff is, is, is handled by AI. I mean, that would be a best case scenario. Um, but I think a lot, a lot of it remains unseen, but I think um, uh, I'm very interested by it. You know, change is going to come and uh, our ability to, adapt with it and to be able to move with it, I think is, um, yeah, it's the, the skill we all need. And that's why I think just being excited to learn, being curious to learn. Um, that's why I think 42 courses, what you guys are doing is, is amazing because you're making learning fun and interesting and, and showing it's a lifelong journey. And I feel like that's the key skill as well is like being open, being ready, excited, curious, how do I use these tools? Um, but I, I do think the stuff that we talk about in sustainable productivity uh, is 
going to be equally important. And I think, you know, I think AI is going to help us with our well-being and um, monitoring some of these things, but it, it it's going to go both ways because you have, you know, I saw a, a story of a, a big UK fintech, you know, tracking everyone's computer time at the office and saying you need 80% of your day in front of your computer. And I, you know, AI, and that's going to make tracking and everything. That's also, a, a, it brings us back to the Taylorism conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to help anyone feel happier at work mm -hmm. um, if every minute is being logged. Mm, very, very wise words, Connor. Um, well, I can see a question there from Alero, and I don't know if you've got enough bandwidth yourself, Alero, to join us and put your question. Um, Alero, are you still with us? I'll carry on and ask the question. Um, so Alero has said, how do we manage expectations from startups or founders to constantly work their people to reach KPIs uh, as it's not a, I don't know what that last sentence means, but yes, certainly we're set to a set tasks. Uh, sometimes they don't really seem to be to any end, do they? This is the thing when we're asked to do something from, from higher up. I think maybe that's what uh, Alero's alluding to. Can you see the question there, Connor? I see it. Is it, is it, do you work in a startup, Alara? Are you there, Alara? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear yeah. you. Do go ahead, Alara. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, hi, I'm Connor. Hi, Louise. So I've been listening and it's very exciting and interesting. So I currently work at a startup, which is YC backed. Um, and I will say that we have about three to four founders. We have four founders actually, uh, and I don't necessarily. I do believe that to some degree there's a concentration of power that's not found as way to trickle down as equally as possible. And so what we have is a situation where founders have ideas, and if you have the idea at two o'clock in the morning at nine a.m., there should be some sort of fleshed out plan on how to execute a plan that was kept, that was brought up at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and then when we do have public holidays, we are told to not necessarily um, recognize them. We should just be on call. And I'm not sure we are developing a very sustainable way of moving. Cause I also think that to some degree, remote work has made people feel like they're talking to machines on the other end of the screen as opposed to a human being. So yeah, just want to know what would you say managing expectations and letting people know that you are actually a human being? Thanks, thanks Alara. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I, my frank answer is if you work for a YC back startup that has going to have super aggressive growth goals because they need to reach a 10x valuation, then um, I wouldn't expect a, a sustainable culture um i would expect it to be you know 60 70 hours a week pushing really hard uh because that's what startups in the yc world are like and um so i don't know how to manage expectations in that style of company i think um that's i i i, I can't knock that approach i think that's how a lot of startups do grow is through just sheer determination of will and excessive amounts of work. I don't think it can be sustained. You know, a lot of times I work with startups that are now, you know, 800 to a thousand or plus. Then they're having the question of now we've, now we're at series D or E uh, we need to now build in a more sustainable culture. And that's where I think that these types of things are very helpful, but um, yeah, it's, it's tough when you, if you're, if you're in an environment like that, uh, I think it's, it's, it's kind of the, the, the norm and, uh, I would be surprised if my boss messaged me at 2 a.m. and then uh, expect me to have done something by 9 a.m. That sounds a little bit outside the box, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. So I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, the uh, you know the best you can do is just is tell people how you best work and mm -hmm. how you know what's working for you. And and when some of these issues come up, you can flag them and say, is there a better way to uh, to communicate these types of asks and, um, yeah, look after yourself in the process. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alera, for your question. And as 
she quite rightly highlights, you know, depending on the type of the company, if it's a startup and you can understand there would be different expectations to uh, keep things chundering along. Um, we're coming towards the end of the event. It's so interesting. You've given us so much practical advice. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that as a result of the global pandemic, work practices changed substantially and very, very quickly. And in many ways, we're still trying to find out what is the best way for each uh, individual company to work most uh, effectively in, in this new world. Increased flexibility doesn't necessarily work for everybody. And a lot of people had difficulty in terms of the sort of overflow of work, home, how to balance it. But I think you've given us some very good practical tools there uh, from the conversation. And as you say, the importance of just recognizing that we're humans that need to take a rest now and again is very, very important. Uh, you mentioned uh, Cal Newport's book. Are there any other books that you think are are useful in this particular area? I particularly like um, I've forgotten what Fortitude is a new book by Bruce Daisley. That's that's nice. a great yeah that's a great book. Have you got any uh, recommendations? I I love uh, Stolen Focus by uh, Johan Hari, Four Thousand Weeks by Oliver Berkman, two that I've loved. Um, I. I always have a copy here, my shameless plug, but this is, you know, the book I, I teach to a lot of companies, didn't write it, but it's called Make Time, How to Focus on What Matters Every Day. It's a really great guide for, um, yeah, focusing and taking care of yourself along the way. So those are, those are three that I, I recommend for sure. Yeah, great suggestions. Maybe we'll do a, a blog following this to collect together. Yeah. yeah, productivity books. They're really great suggestions. And so just before we wrap up there, uh, maybe you could just give us, you know, your sort of top top three, top three tips for, for being uh, productive without burning out in the workplace. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. I think um, I would recommend people to choose one big thing every day to, to make their, their most important priority. And we call that a highlight and make time and devote an hour, hour and a half to that every day uh, and feel really good if if you make progress on that project. You can still check off to-dos and attend your meetings, but having a, having a focal point to your day is really valuable. Um, I would encourage people to take some time to look at their, their screens and their environment and, and ask themselves, you know, what is going to help me stay focused and on task and what's going to distract from that. And um, if you have 35 tabs open, as Chris said in the chat, <laughs> I really recommend uh, trying a day where you only have tabs open related to what you're working on and um, think about it like gardening. You got to prune back some of the weeds and they'll come back, the tabs will open, but at the end of each day, you can shut things down. Um, and, and I really encourage focus on the environment. And the third piece is to take breaks. Uh, we talked about that, but Give yourself some time to rest and recover, uh, move your body in those breaks, uh, get outside, breathe some fresh air, uh, getting away from screens will likely help. So my my top three tips for you today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Connor. It's been really, uh, really kind of feel refreshed having spoken with you today. So I hope that everybody else has the same sort of feeling from this call. I do thank you all for joining us. Thank this you. is Connor Swenson of Forgewell, and we are 42 Courses. Uh, you are all very, very welcome to be with us today, and I do hope you'll join us again for future events. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.